Unworthy am I of the grace that he gave. Unworthy to hold to his hand. Amazed that a king would reach down to a slave. This love I cannot understand. Unworthy, unworthy, a beggar in bondage and alone. But he made me worthy, and now. mercy has made me his own. My sorrows and sickness put stripes on his back. My sins cause the blood that was shed. My faults and my failures have woven a crown of thorns that he wore on his head. Unworthy, unworthy, a beggar in bondage and alone. But And now by his grace, his mercy has made me his own. Unworthy am I of the glory to come. Unworthy with angels to sing. I thrill just to know that he loved me so much. A pauper, I walk with the king. Unworthy, unworthy, a beggar. mercy has made me his own. I always have a hard time with that song because it's so true. None of us are worthy of the grace that he gave. We have so many voices throughout the land today, and they're not giving out the message that Jesus gave. They're giving out a message of lovely cars, boats on the lake, beautiful vacations, happy tiptoe through the tulip stuff. Jesus didn't talk about that. I look in vain to see that. See, now, I wasn't reared on that kind of pap and cotton candy. I thank God for my Baptist heritage because I came up in a time when Baptists believed something. A lot of them did, the people I came in contact. And they believed in the message of the book. And I got a heavy dose of sacrifice, self-denial, and cross-bearing. And I just can't swallow this new stuff. It just regurgitates. Every time I swallow it, try to swallow it, and try to get at peace with all this mess, I just throw up. Because it isn't scriptural. The world has never been a friend to grace. 
Nobody has ever loved Jesus in this whole wicked world. Just the people who've been delivered by his grace. <laughs> I cry a lot when I sing. I got a whole tape of my balling tape, I call it. Somebody went through all the service tapes we have here and they pulled off all the songs where I broke down and bawled in the middle of them and put it on one tape. And I said, what in the world did you do that for? I said, it's good. <laughs> and you know, it's one of the most popular music tapes we got. People just sit and bawl and they bawl right along with me when I'm singing. But, you know, it's, not, it's, it's wrong not to cry about some things. It's too bad that the tears have dried up in the pulpits. People are crying because they have a mortgage instead of because of what Jesus said we ought to cry about. You know why we ought to, we ought to have preachers weeping in the pulpit? Not trying to work the people. Not trying to pull shady deals and confidence games on God's people. Not trying to rape the people of God and take away what little money they have and false pretenses. I'll be like in Jeremiah, the ninth chapter. You want to turn there? That's where we're going to start. Jeremiah chapter 9. While you're turning there, I was in a meeting recently and a fellow was there who was a singer, had a great deal of training. Now, I, I haven't had any musical training. Of course, I don't have to tell you that. You can tell that if you listen. Uh, those notes look like little boys climbing through a fence to me. And I just uh, sing by letter. I open up and let her fly. And I sing songs that are close to my heart. And this man came up to me in the meeting and he said, you know when I've been listening to some of your, ta your song tapes. I said, you have? And he said, yes. He said, you know, you don't have very much of a voice. And I said, I know. <laughs> and he said, well, he's being very frank, but he said, he said, Good Lord, man, there's such an anointing on those tapes, I can't sit still when I hear them. I looked at him, he's a younger fella. I said, son, that's all I have. If you wonder why I'm pushing across the country and going around the country be going back to Indonesia this year because Indonesia is a flame for the lips. And when I sing unworthy, I'm not kidding. Listen, I got this job by default. Nobody else wanted it. Nobody wanted to carry deliverance matter. Nobody wanted to butt heads with all the powers that be, religious and otherwise to stand up for the truth of deliverance. And God gave it to me. And by his grace, I'll wave that flag in the devil's face as I leave to go to glory. I'll say, here, I'll stick it down your throat before I leave. I haven't any intention of quitting. I told demons a long time ago, if they're gonna stop me, they couldn't buy me, they, the only way they do is just kill me. And they said, we've tried. Oh, we've tried with great intensity. But you see, if you're doing the master's business, it's different. Look at Jeremiah chapter nine. Oh, that my head were waters. My eyes were fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain, the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a logic place of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go from them. For they all be adulterous, assembly of treacherous men. They bend their tongues like bow for lies. They're not valiant for the truth of the earth. They proceed from evil to evil, they know not me, saith the Lord. That's how Jeremiah felt. I've had just a little touch of his 
thing. When God opens your eyes to see the bondage in the church. He said, well, aren't you evangelistic? Yes. But you know, I, I concentrate on the church. I think if we can get the church straightened out, there'll be such a revival of people getting saved you've never seen before. You know, a lot of lost people walk into these churches with these high-powered Johnny Jerk-Up preachers that are milking the crowd for everything they can get. A lot of lost people walk into those crowds and say, That's, that guy's a phony. And the people who are sitting in that congregation don't even know it. And yet a lost person who supposedly has no discernment can walk in and spot that crook a mile away. Now, you know, I don't care what you call them. You can call them a stink kitty, a pole cat, but if it's black, got yellow, a white stripe down its back, and it smells like one, it's a skunk. And I'll tell you, if you got a crook in the pulpit, I don't care how you dress him up, spray him up, and fix him up, and dress him up, and all this, he's still a skunk. And he ought to be exposed. Jeremiah was weeping because of the slaughter of the people of God. And the thing that's so tragic today, people, is that there's so few that have any, any notion that it's even going on. And they don't even care. Most of them are busy with the mortgage note. They're not busy with the thing that Jesus came to do. You see, God didn't tell us to build cities. And yet everywhere we're having religious people tell us, God told me to build a city. Hog wash. He did not. Now, somebody told him, but it wasn't God because his word didn't say that. His word said scatter. Cities are the cesspools and the breeding places of sin on a large scale. Now, we're stuck with them. I don't suggest we go out and dynamite them and try to get rid of them. But I'm just saying this foolishness about God told me to build a city is just that. It's foolishness. And yet we see millions of dollars being raised to build cities. I just heard today another Jim Baker's things. He's going to build a crystal palace. It'll cost $20 million, a replica of one in England. God told him to do it. I knew he'd find something else to spend money on when he got this other and paid for him. He's got $65 million or better invested over there now in Disneyland PTL. That's what it's going to be. Friend, there's something bad wrong when you can pass off shallowness for spirituality. I know, Pastor Willie, he's always grabbing and belly, and if he'd just leave that off, why doesn't he appreciate what God's doing? I do appreciate what God's doing. But I hate it when people are deceived and are leading thousands of people astray. I repeat, this little church, and it's still a very small church, this little church has significantly blessed the body of Christ in this country and around the world, and it's, con it's growing all the time. We don't even know how far and wide the principles, the biblical principles that God has taught us and given to us that we put down on paper and tape and sent out all over the country. We don't even know how far they've gone. But they've blessed the body of Christ and nobody has gone broke. Nobody has had to have fundraisers or anything else. You know what God told me? He said, if every little church would do its job, what I tell it to do, there'd be no need for these massive multi-million dollar disasters. And friend, when the whole system collapses, these people are sitting on a bubble that's going to pop, and they're going to go down the tube with the rest of them. And they're going to lock them up and foreclose them. You watch what I tell you. But that's what I'm talking to you about. Why don't we have people who are hearing from God today? Well, I don't think it's so hard to hear from the Lord myself. Look at Matthew 10, 37. 
Matthew 10. Well, let's start with 34. Matthew 10, 34, Jesus said, Think not that I'm come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Wait a minute. Now, Lord Jesus, you didn't read the latest denominational bulletins. We're having our unity conferences. Get everybody together under the same blanket. But Jesus didn't talk like that. He said, I came to, with a sword, not to bring. He said, you think I came to bring peace? You have no idea what a hornet's nest is going to stir up when the truth hits that religious hornet's nest. He said, I'm come to set a man at variance against his father, daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and the man's foes shall be they of his own household. And you thought something unusual was happening to you when you got into deliverance. All that's happening to you is exactly what Jesus said would when you stumbled into the truth. That it's going to look like the whole world has gone against you. And yet all these people are telling us, get everybody together. It's love, 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 love. <laughs> oh, how lovely, lovely, lovely. And you're all right, and I'm all right, you know. And there's no sin to worry about. Just drop all your principles and join in the tiptoe through the tulips as we march around the, again and again and again. <coughs> Flat tire. That sort of thing is as far under Scripture as it can be. There are happy times for God's people. But I'll tell you what, when the nation is heading right into a storm of judgment, it's not time for tip throw through the tulips and playing games and let's have a hopscotch game. It's time to get down to business and weep before the Lord while there's still time before the destruction hits. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's hard. Now do you see why there are not many people following Jesus? There are not many people following this. There are people who belong to this fellowship who are not in this service. And yet some of you came miles away. You think everybody here at Hegwish is glorious. Well, we're a long way from that. But there are people who are members here, resident members, and they're not in this workshop. They took off and went here, there, and yonder. That's all right. I'll never ask them where they were, but I expect God will. But I don't spend a lot of time worrying about them because I know the devil's going to whip them off the bush one of these days. And there's no use in me wasting a lot of time worrying and fuming about them. Because, friend, in deliverance, you burn in or you burn out. You say, well, that's kind of cold-hearted. We have the open-door policy here. I didn't invite you. If God didn't send you goodbye, the door opens both ways. You're welcome to stay if you want to learn and, 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 and get God's blessings. If you, if you get mad and you throw your nose out of joint, well, goodbye and blessings on you. You're going to need it. Because once you visited a deliverance work, the devil's got you marked. He pegged you. By the way, did you know that you're marked? You say, well, wait a minute. I just came check this thing out. <laughs> well, that's too bad. I hate to be the bearer of bad tidings, but uh, the devil's already made note of this. And he's already made assignments to you. And if I were you, I wouldn't look back because you're liable to have a heart attack from what's following you. <laughs> what I'd do, I'd, just, I'd, I'd learn everything I could on deliverance. I'd get the books. I'd get the Bible. I'd listen to what Brother Norman's talking about. And I'd listen real close and say, Lord, help me to keep on the move because they pick off the stragglers. Stay with the bunch. I'm telling you, just keep on a going. <laughs> you may be leaping Lena, but you better, you, if you stop, they'll get you. You have no idea what's following you now. You say, well, I didn't mean it. Well, they'll never forget it. <laughs> Sometime back, I was aggravating a demon. I didn't mean to. It was sort of an accident. <laughs> But uh, I was aggravating one, and, and I said, you know, sometimes I get real tired, demon. I said, uh, I think it was a prince or something. I said, 
I just get tired of fighting all the time and traveling all the time and pressure all the time. Me and my church members just being stomped around all the time and people talking ugly and they say whirly, <laughs> you know. It's kind of like it's another syllable on the end of it. And, and uh, I said, if I was to just call a halt and just pull all the tapes and books and, and just call off the attack, would you boys consider a truce? He looked at me with such intense hatred. And he said, you got to be out of your cotton-picking mind, Worley. <laughs> he said, as much damage as you've done, I'll tell you one thing. We never forget and we never forgive. I said, oh, well, I figured that, but I just thought I'd check it out. <laughs> well, then you come on out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, it's nice to have fun when you're working. Uh, <clears throat> but Jesus, Jesus calls for all out surrender. He calls for a dedication and surrender that's frightening. He calls for nothing else. He said, he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Now, what's your cross? Well, what was Jesus' cross? It marked him out for death. You ready to go that far? If you're not, I'd suggest you study into it. You, may, you might meet the death angel down the road a piece. And if you're scared of it, the devil will rattle him before you all the time. He'll rattle your cage every day. He'll say, you're going to die. You're going to die. You say, well, that happens to me sometimes. And I get so scared. You do. Why? You say, well, it's scary. Well, are you born again? You going to heaven when you die? Well, yeah. Well, okay. Then next time he says, you're going to die, you're going to die. Say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. <laughs> My land, you just, he just helped you get there. Wouldn't that be great to have a boost? You know, did you ever try to climb a tree when you was a kid and you couldn't quite make it to that first limb? You was just a scram and somebody come along and give you a boost? Well, that's kind of like, you know, you're trying to get to heaven and, and the demon come along and give you a boost. That'd be nice. <laughs> they tell me they're going to kill me. I say, oh, well, good. I said, I'll tell Jesus you helped me get there. And I get to heaven. <laughs> but they, they lie. They've threatened to kill me over and over again. Now I just tell them promises, promises. That's all I ever get. <laughs> if you don't take your cross and follow after me, Jesus said, you're not worthy of me. Doggone it. And that brings that song back to my mind. Listen. How can you pull up the white flag on Jesus? How can you say, it's too much. I'm not going to go any further. Forget it. Knock it off. Hang it in your ear. I don't want it. How can you do that to Jesus? I can say I can do it to people. But how can you do him that way? If you don't take up your cross, follow me. He said, you're not worthy. He that finds his life shall lose it. You know what that means? He that spends all his time making money, doing what he wants to, going on vacations, recreating, and having a big diamond, raising a family, and just having happy, 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 happy. You're losing everything. But he that loses his life for my sake will find it. You'll find out what life's all about. Not by gain, but by giving. Isn't that what Jesus did? Who is our pattern? He has left us an example that we should follow in his steps. His steps lead to the cross. And friend, I have to tell you to tell you the truth, that if you follow Jesus, you're going to die. You're first going to die to a lot of things here. By dying, I mean you're going to get to the place where they don't pull on you anymore. They don't matter anymore. You're going to be isolated from the crowd. 
But I read in a book years and years ago something that stuck with me. It said, when you walk with the Lord, if you really determine to be His, if you really determine to lay your life on the Lord, you're going to be isolated. And you'll be lonely in the midst of a crowd. But don't despair because isolation is insulation. And just like you isolate these high wires that go on these high lines across the country, they're isolated from all the other wires and from the ground, and they have a big insulator that keeps them from touching the pole, touching ground, or touching any other wire. But that's the only way they can be trusted to carry large charges of power. Now, the reason we see such a lack of power in the lives of believers and in our churches today is because leaders and people are not willing to pay the price of isolation. They're not willing because it doesn't mean that much to them. How much does serving Jesus mean to you? Brother Norman sitting over here has gone from his home and family about six months out of the year. How would you like to have a job like that? Doesn't that sound thrilling? You want to jet around the country with me? Oh, how romantic. You rush down to O'Hare, you get on a jet plane, hopefully, and then after the devil delays it an hour or two, you take off. My planes have unusual problems. <laughs> they do. <laughs> One time we were on a big 747, I believe it was, and we were all set to go to California nonstop, and I thought, well, in four hours I'll be on the West Coast, and <sighs> just <clears throat> seated and leaned back, you know, and <laughs> the pilot came on the horn, and he said, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, said, uh, I don't know, We've had an unusual thing happen that never, never have seen this happen in all the years I've been a pilot. I thought, oh, what have they done this time? <laughs> he said, we know that the outer door, cabin door, is shut and locked, but the warning light showing that it's open is on, on the, on the cockpit dashboard, and we're not allowed to take off until that's in order. Now, we know there's just a short or something, but... Uh, until that's cleared up, we can't talk. About 10 minutes, we'll be on our way. 30 to 40 minutes later, we finally did get on our way. Another time, <laughs> we were on well, another 747 going west, and they taxied out. We said, ladies and gentlemen, we're glad to announce we're going to take off on time. We'll arrive in Los Angeles right on time, and they taxied out to the end runway. And we're number two in line. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there'll be a slight delay. We're having difficulty starting one of our outboard engines. <laughs> <laughs> but in 10 minutes, we'll have a jumper cart out here, and then we'll be on our way. Uh, no great deal. We'll probably make up the 10 minutes in flight. 45 minutes later, the engine finally started, and we were on our way. See, it was necessary for me to be late and by the time I got to where I was going, it was after 9 o'clock, but still, there were still about 150, 200 people still waiting. And we had a wing doozy. But the demons knew that. Now, I never say anything about it when I'm on the plane. I just sit there and look innocent. <laughs> well, I mean, how would you feel? Some of those folks may have read the story of Jonah and say, if they, we toss this big one off, we can get on our way. <laughs> If you want to pay a price, if you won't pay a price, you won't make a mark. I can guarantee you that. Don't worry about these little sissy bitches that are running around with lace on their drawers and, and uh, uh, they're so sweet and better with milk in their mouth and they just love everybody. Sloppy a guppy all over the place. <laughs> We're going to blow up balloons for the kids and give all the kitties that pack the pew. We're going to give a bicycle and a trip to camp to those that bring the most. Lord have mercy. I'd like to see the Apostle Paul walk in the middle of something like that. 
can you imagine what a commotion he'd create? He'd say, let's get rid of these demons of commercialism and wickedness, diversion. Churches have become little, little entertainment centers. Now, what are they going to do to entertain us today? And, and, you know, they're always in building programs. Lord me, they're always building. Oh, we just got in this building. Now we got a bunch more. We're just overcrowded. We're going to have to build again. We're going to have to go down and get another mortgage. Well, I can tell them how to quit that. Just have a deliverance meeting. The church will split in half, and you'll have plenty of room. <laughs> you won't have to build. Very simple. You know, there's no big, big secret to it. It'll... I go to some of these places, uh, some of these preachers, bless their heart, they get, they get hold of one of the books and they call me, oh, praise God, I got so excited when I read your books, Pastor. Can you come? Can you come? I said, are you sure you want me to? I said, probably tear your church in half. Oh, no, no, our church is strong. I thought, oh, Lord, I thought that once too. <laughs> and we make an agreement, you know, and everything, and we come along and he's so confident, yeah, we got everybody coming. Well, they make the first night usually. They may make it through three nights. But then later on I hear from him, well, you know, Pastor Hurley, I wouldn't have believed it, but you know, you told me a bunch of these folks are going to leave, and they did. I couldn't believe it. I thought they was really hooked in. It'll really weed them out because, you see, deliverance calls for commitment. I mean, it calls for all-out commitment, life on the line, blood, guts, feathers, and everything else. You don't hold back anything when you go into deliverance. And you're not going to find many people like that. Look at Luke chapter 9. And look at our pattern. You want to be like Jesus? Didn't you ever sing that song? To be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, all my life to be like him. It's a beautiful song. Good one too. But do you really want to be like him? Well, let's take a look at how he was. The Son of Man, verse 22, 922, Luke 922. Son of Man must suffer many things to be like Jesus. <laughs> suffer. Uh, he must be rejected of the elders, chief priests, priests and scribes. All the religious leaders will say, <clears throat> to be like Jesus. <laughs> Are you still with me? Did you ever play Pop the Whip? The people on the end, you know, they snap off. They can't hang on. Are you going to be like Jesus? This is how he was. He was hated. He was rejected. He suffered. They killed him. You ready to be killed? To be like Jesus? But he was raised the third day. Now, you may not die on the cross. Some people say, oh, I don't mind dying for Jesus. Now watch it. Uh, they, all the deaths are not physical. Paul talks about a living sacrifice. It's not so hard to be a dead sacrifice. You know, you line up and firing squad says, you're going to repent? You're going to recant, Jesus? No. Bang! And then you go to heaven. That's kind of nice, you know. Kind of a quickie. The angel said, here comes another crew. Just went, came in, you know. Shot down for the faith, refused to back up. But how about if you don't die? Hmm? How about everyday living and being a sacrifice to them? And he said to them, Jesus said he would, he'd have to be raised third day. And by the way, if you want to be raised up in resurrection power, you're going to have to die first. A lot of people always hollering for power, you know. Well, they hadn't died yet. You know how you know they're alive? You touch them and those little nerves, short nerves, you know, ah, leave me alone. <laughs> Don't touch me. Don't bother me. You have no right to ask that. It's too much. It's too hard. It's too long. Never cease to amaze me how a bunch of people can go out to one of these parks, sit on a little eight-inch plank, 
and scream like Comanche Indians, sit on that plank out in the rain, the snow, and hot sun, and come in and say, we won. I got laryngitis from screaming, you know. And they come to church and sit like a bunch of wooden Indians. They got all excited about that football out there. In my land, the thing's not any good. It's all lopsided from being kicked, I guess. And uh, there's a piece of pig skin out there. And they're kicking it and running it. I went to a football game one time. My brother-in-law talked me into going. He said, you've just never seen a college game. Now, that would really excite you. And I said, I don't think so. I said, I want you to take my wife. She likes football. I don't care anything about it. Oh, yeah, come on, win. Go, I got the tickets. And so I let him talk me into it. But he'll never talk me into it again. He won't even try. I was never so bored in all my life. Every time anything exciting happened, they jumped up and hollered. You couldn't see nothing. <laughs> and then, you know, I sat there and, and they did the same thing over and over again. And I was bored. I thought, good, man. And here I am, didn't even bring a book. You can gather that I'm not a fan. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I think it is kind of stupid to take up all your time with something like that. You better be careful. It'll get a hold of you, and it'll take all your interest and all your love. Better watch it. Demons have, have testified to the God of sports ruling over America. That old one-eyed tube, boy, they put them on at prime time. They know how to get them. And like Norman was pointing out, you know all the things about football, baseball, basketball, but you don't know diddly flip about God's Word. Your priorities are all messed up. And you can't say you're following Jesus. The call to surrender is absolute. The call to all out sacrifice. You say, well, do I have to just give up everything? Well, that would help. And then God could get on to cutting off the other parts that you don't know about. I mean, you know, we holler about the things we see and we imagine we're going to be so horribly restricted. Well, now, of course, one thing about it, you know, if your social life is so busy, you say, well, I just don't have time to do a lot of things. I have so much, so many social obligations, so many people I have to see and everything, you know. Well, all you have to do is get in deliverance and you'll lose most of that. The people won't want to have anything to do with you. They, they'll, they'll, they'll say, would you just say unclean, unclean every time you come so we can run the other way? They don't want to be around you. I mean, you won't have any problem with having lots of, you'll have more time to pray and read the Bible, my, my, my. But you know, the, the problem with all of us is when that happens, we think, well, here I was serving the Lord. What good did it do? Thanks a lot. <laughs> Just glorious. Sitting here by myself. That's the way we usually go, isn't it? No hands, please. It'd be embarrassing. <laughs> I don't want to fan the air at this point. <laughs> he said, if any man will come after me, let him prepare to have money. Prepare to go on trips. Prepare to have expensive automobiles. Prepare to enjoy the red carpet rolling out to welcome him everywhere he goes. No, he said, let him deny himself. You know what deny means? Do without. Well, you're not going to get any recruits that way, Worley. You're supposed to dangle a little carrot out there. You're just using the stick. Well, there's a carrot over there, but you need the stick first. Take away your appetite, and you'll be so glad to get the carrot, you'll enjoy it then. <laughs> Won't sit around and gripe because you just have an old carrot to nibble on. Let him deny himself, take up his cross at least once a week. Well, I mean, you're supposed to show up in church. How often? Daily. Come on. Cross-bearing. You know one of the things that Jesus went through? Loneliness. Did you know he was one of the loneliest people who ever walked on this earth? You say, how can you say that? He was surrounded by people all the time. 
Yep, most of the time he had lots of people around him. But he was one of the loneliest persons in the world. You know why? Because nobody understood what he was doing. Nobody but the Heavenly Father really understood what he was doing. The, men, the people closest to him did not understand, did not comprehend what he was doing. And that'll make you so lonely. But you know something? The Lord is so mindful of our frailties and our weaknesses. He'll usually give us somebody that'll halfway understand what we're driving at. Although you'll have to go through some lonely stretches. But usually once in a while, you'll have a bright spot. You'll have a brother or sister come along and you can sit down and share and you'll think, oh, that's so good. So refreshing. It's like an oasis. And then you, the Lord said, it's time to go. You say, Lord, let's, don't, let's stay a while. You know, this is so nice. Why don't I have to go out there? And then the sand dunes and lizards and snakes out there and cactus. And nothing pretty out there. It's nice here. So relaxing. He said, I know, but it's time to move on. And you go on and then you look for that next time. You see, Jesus doesn't leave us as alone as he was. He's so gracious. Just as you think you're just going to give up and cave in, it's just not worth it at all, somebody will come along with a hand from Jesus. It may have a paddle in it. <laughs> I just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> See, now, if I don't comment on that, you'll just think all kinds of things, and you'll amplify it for yourself. You got to take up your cross and daily and follow me, he said. For whosoever will save his life will lose it. Here again, if you try to save it for yourself, you're going to lose everything you're trying to get. And if you lose your life for my sake, you'll save it. For what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world, lose himself, or be cast away? What good is it if you've got everything the world's got to offer and don't have the Lord? Haven't you seen some of these people these famous people being interviewed, they have nothing to live for. They've lived their whole lives. They have piles of money. They've gone everywhere, seen everything, done everything. And yet if you look in their eyes when they come on television, their eyes are vacant, empty, hungry, searching. Every once in a while you'll find one of them that runs right into Jesus and gets all excited about Jesus, even in the sunset of life. And they're just like Paul. They say, throw away everything else and hang on to this. This is the best of all. Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and in his fathers and of the holy angels. My, my. You want God to be ashamed of you? You want Jesus to be ashamed of you? Well, he said it was possible. Look at Philippians now for a minute. Just ambling through the scriptures, there's lots of them. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Go to Philippians chapter 3. Let's go to 2 first. Pick up Philippians 2 8. Jesus, being found in fashion as a man, humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. There's not much of any way we can understand how horrible the death of the cross was. The physical aspects were gruesome, but the other aspects were even worse. Go to Philippians 3, 7. Jesus humbled himself now and became obedient. That's another thing that happens when you surrender, you become obedient. Paul says, the things which were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things for law, but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. This man said, I throw away everything I ever had for the one thing I have now, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. All the fame, all the recognition, all the power, influence, friends, everybody, everything I had before, I throw it all away 
and choose the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Now Paul said, for whom I have built cities and glorious works to echo his name, the St. Paul Cathedral, the St. Paul Camp, the Paul this and the Paul that. What did he do? He suffered the loss of all things. I have a sneaking suspicion Paul lost his wife over it. He said, I don't believe that. Well, I'm going to ask him when I get to heaven. And I'm going to come over and tell you, see, see I told you. <laughs> Paul was definitely married. You had to be married to be a Pharisee and you had to be married to be on the Sanhedrin. He qualified on both counts. But he never calls himself a widower when he talks to those that lost their companion, so he hadn't lost her by death. But I think she left him. Of course, he didn't go around whining and hunting another bed partner. He, was, he said, I lost everything, and I'm going to gain everything in Jesus. So he took out after the Lord. He said, I suffered the loss of all things, if you're going to see what all he lost, look over in Galatians, I think that's where he gives his testimony, over in Acts where he recounts all the things that he had. He threw them all overboard. He said, I count them but manure compared to what I found in Christ and what I can find in Christ and what I received by being a surrendered vessel to him. He said, I compare all this other stuff as just manure to be flushed down the toilet. It's not even worth, it's not even in the same classification. Paul could have been an outstanding rabbi. He could have been an outstanding leader in Judaism. He was a leader. He was highly respected, extremely intelligent. And he threw away all of that, dumped it overboard and seized the prize of the high calling What are you going to seize today? You're just going to reach out and get a bunch of nothing? Some of these things that people are talking about, friend, won't last. Did you know a lot of things people are spending their life on, their energy on, their interest on? Did you know they won't even warrant mentioning in heaven, let alone counting? If they count it all, it'd be negatively. My, look what you lost because you were such a stupid fool. You got wrapped up in that, that foolishness. When well, everybody was doing it, now I thought it'd be all right to do it just a little. You know, it was innocent. It was nice. Took up all my time, of course, and naturally I couldn't go to church if I was doing that. If I was tired, you know, after all, I have to recreate. Well, you'll recreate plenty when you get to heaven. And you say, well, I just have, I believe you have to do this and I believe you have to do that. Well, just help yourself. I don't have to make your choice. You don't have to make mine. But I'm telling you what Jesus said. He called for an all-out surrender. I mean, he said blood and guts on the line, friend. And this is not just a New Testament doctrine. It's Old Testament. Remember when they drew the line in the dirt? Choose ye this day whom you will serve. If you're going to serve God, serve him. If you're going to serve Baal, serve him. Uh, but choose ye this day whom you will serve. With me and my house, we're going to serve God. He laid it on the line. Now, how do you serve the Lord? Matthew 23. Jesus' disciples were very human. They were so much like us, it's frightening. Peter was the pop-off. He had a loud mouth. He'd, he'd speak at the drop of a hat before he thought. He could make the biggest mess and be the sorriest of it of anybody. Philip was the dull one. This took him forever to understand something. Matter of fact, if you check the Gospels, if Jesus wanted to find out if everybody understood something, he said, did you get that, Philip? And Philip said, yeah. He said, well, everybody got it then. You know, so he knew if Philip caught on to it, well, Philip, he wasn't dumb. He was just a little slow, you know. And there was Thomas, you know, he was the analytical one. He had to analyze everything. He had all kinds of funny folks in his lunch. 
And uh, they were interested in who's going to be the biggest and who's going to be the best and who's going to get the recognition. Of course, we're humble. We don't really care about that, but who is? <laughs> and uh, I'm writing my memoirs, my humility and how I attained it to leave for the little people, you know. Law, me goodness. Matthew 23, verse 11. He that is greatest among you shall be marked out by the fact that everybody runs to wait on him. Not so. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Ooh, that word servant's very strong too. In the Greek, it's slave. Well, I'm not going to be your slave. Forget it. That's all right. Then you won't be great either. And whosoever shall exalt himself, that's right. If you don't help yourself, God helps those who help themselves. That's what the Bible says. It doesn't say any such thing. It said, He that exalts himself shall be brought low, abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. You say, well, I just have a lot of trouble with pride. Don't we all? It's a very common affliction. And just when you think you've got rid of it, there's an old black thing peeping over your shoulder saying, hey, we're still here. I was dealing with pride one time, a long time ago, and I was, I said, what's your name? He said, pride. I said, okay, pride, come on out. Well, we would tussle around a little bit and right around, ah! I said, all right, next demon, step up. What's your name? Pride. <laughs> I said, I thought you just left. He said, well, that was big pride. I'm little pride. Everybody needs me. And I said, well, we'll risk doing without you. And out he went. Everybody needs a little pride, you know. No, no, no. Just a little is enough to spoil the whole thing. He that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Now you say, oh, I wish I, I need to be humble. Oh, I want to be humble. Lord, humble me. Ooh, be careful. You said, you mean the Lord can't do it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's like asking a bulldozer, a little black ant saying, mash me. <laughs> Can he do it? Oh, you bet. But it doesn't say that, does it? It says, if you humble yourself, that means you come down off the high horse, you don't have to get knocked off. Amen. If you're riding a high horse, you know, and you're touchy and you got your feelings on you, don't you bother me, I'll get mad. Don't you upset me. And pretty soon people say, oh, there comes that one again. Bind it, bind it. <laughs> but you know if you, it, it, wouldn't it be better if you if you jump off the horse rather than wait uh, galloped and hit you went under a tree and you knocked off on a limb uh, either way you'd get off the horse rather quickly but if I was going to have to get off I think I'd, I would rather jump off wouldn't you rather than wait for that limb to knock me off and that's exactly what's coming because pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. Well, there's much more we could go to. 1 John 2, 15 and 17 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You say, well, I just feel so mean and ugly and unclean at times because I don't want to love the Lord. I don't want to. I've, I've told a lot of times, one time I ran across a young person who looked at me and said, but I don't want to be holy. I said, there's no danger. <laughs> Some people think it's just gonna sneak up on them and leap on them by surprise. Friends, you got to work at following Jesus. And I hope you will. 
Love not the world, neither the things in the world. If any man love the world, love the Father's not in him. 